Pastor Erwin Lutzer, who was my first pastor um, in Chicago, in his um, 2015 updated book, Seven Reasons Why You Can Trust the Bible, shares a, a prediction that was made in 1890 by one of the biologist friends of Charles Darwin. T.H. Huxley wrote, I visualize the day when faith will be separate, separated from fact, and then faith will go on triumphantly forever. Of course, he and his naturalist friends must have considered such faith silly because it would then be up to each individual to choose whatever faith was right for him or her. And as long as no one asked whether a belief was true, there could be as many different faiths as there are people in the world. Huxley's day is here. Asking whether a person's belief is based on something factual is no longer the point. And more often than not, that inquiry is taken as inappropriate. People don't seem to want or care if belief has anything to do with fact. In fact, the very term fact has been victimized by deconstruction in our culture. But Christians, Christians have a faith that is dramatically different than the trendy relativistic spirituality. Biblical Christianity is radically different than relativistic spirituality. We are not to be in the category of relativistic spirituality. That's not us. Ours is a faith that is grounded in the real world of history and fact. If, if this is not what we have, if this is not what we have, the, the Apostle Paul's assessment that he reveals in 1 Corinthians 15 would also apply. He said, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, that is, if that event was not an established irrefutable fact, then we are of all people most to be pitied. We're ridiculous and and still lost and without hope and missing out on all the so-called fun that we could be having. If biblical Christianity is not based upon the factual, then it's a movement of, of, of gluttons for punishment, compromising one quarter or so of the world's population and would have died out many years ago. The French philosopher Francois-Marie Arouet, better known as Voltaire, um, who died 10 years before the start of the French Revolution, once said, a hundred years from my death, the Bible will be a museum piece. And it's interesting that a hundred years after Voltaire's death, the French Bible Society set up its headquarters in Voltaire's old home in Paris. The Bible has not been debunked and discarded from the world, though individuals and whole groups are endeavoring to make it so. The spirituality of our day has been divorced from fact, meaning that one can believe whatever one likes, no matter how contradictory or absurd. We're getting into the absurd, reflecting that we've been handed over to the place depraved minds um, end up. And the gist is this, every point of view, since it arises from one's own feelings, is just as valid as another. That is the prevailing conviction, if you could call it that. And, and Pastor Lutzer makes the observation, we are living at a time when humanistic thinking is coming to its natural conclusions in morals, education, and law. When educators in public schools are placing dog bowls in bathrooms for youth who are identifying as canines, 
to drink from. Something is going horribly wrong. This, the insanity reaches further. Any teacher who objects, what do you think happens to them? One of the most significant and credible voices among the few that are left in the world that haven't surrendered to the soji realm, and that meaning sexual, it's an acronym, sexual orientation, gender identity expression. One of the few voices, one of the few significant or credible voices that haven't surrendered to Soji or the myriad of directions from the LGBTQ is biblical Christianity. I mean, an emphasis on biblical, biblical Christianity. There are a few other voices. I said one of the few, but there are a couple of other voices, but their foundation is, is a form of existentialism or political. We must be equipped and be courageous or we'll find that we're going to be cowering in a corner someday. Other entities saw the canceling power from a distance and have waved the white flag of surrender. It used to be called caving in. Um, corporations and entities of all kinds want to be on the right side of history, as they say, and so are going woke. That's just a mind-boggling contradiction of terms. You know, if we're to be salt and light, Jesus said his followers are to be reflecting, you know, reflective of him being his ambassadors. And I would just say, listen to me, my brothers and sisters, we need a firmer grip on why the Bible is our authority. We need a firmer grip on this and the reasons why it is our authority, why it's safe and right to apply to ourselves the motto, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. The Bible's revelation is why all men will one day give an account. Give an account to the righteous standards that it reveals, which are based upon God's holy character. This book is his self-disclosure. Tampering with it, whether we think it, you know, tampering, I guess, whether we think it's, it's true or not, is a risk of eternal proportions. And yet the, the flagrant disregard continues. There are still those, however, who the Spirit of God is wooing to Christ, and we prayed for those. This morning was Lori's request, and we need to continue to pray because we can't say the whole works is a lost cause. We are still on mission, and we still have the lamp to our feet and the light to our path. And so, so that's why we return today to shore up our convictions about God's word. Now, I realize that in the bulletin, in fact, this was our plan, that this morning we would start a three-part little mini-series on holy sexuality. And yet, you know, in thinking about addressing from the culture that which has become extremely controversial, that it might be good to revisit why we feel that the scripture speaks God's mind and heart on these matters and all other matters and why it's authoritative. And so for three weeks, we're going to look at that, why the Bible is trustworthy. And then we'll go into that, that topic together. My, um, my uh, uh, counsel uh, to us all is that we would not miss any of these messages. Let's, let's focus on being here. If we can't physically be here to, to um, listen and watch the um, YouTube channel. 
Okay, so I would say this as we return today to shore up our convictions about God's word, that we must continually do this. It's not a matter of, well, we learned all these things at one time. We must continually do this or we are going to find ourselves drifting in a current. And the power of that current has only increased in recent years. Most of us feel woefully inadequate to, to, to have even the simplest of conversations where we articulate why we cannot agree with the prevailing path of humanity. Most of us feel inadequate. The elders here see, see that, as many of us do, what's happening in society today and why believers must find their voices again. Um, why the few remaining vocal people who say, you know, but wait, wait, let's follow the one true God and his holy word, <laughs> you know, as we have opportunity even at the peril of being led away to be punished which, you know, is not that hard to conceive, being right around the corner. What an opportunity to give reason for the hope that we have. You know, that's where we sit, in the place of incredible opportunity to give reason for the hope that we have it's no accident that we are here and alive for such a time as this. And, and though if you're like me, you know, you've spent more time, I've spent more time fantasizing about living in the good old days in the way that it used to be. We spent a lot of time wishing to turn the clock back, the calendar back. It's not going back unless there's incredible revival and God can send it. God can send that. But it's going to be based upon his word. And so, you know, by the way, what's, you know, I guess what's the passage, that verse that when I referred to just now about being ready to, you know, always be always being ready to give reason for the hope that we have. Um, it's first Peter. It's first Peter chapter three, you know, a book that we just spent some first and second Peter. Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Doing evil, as it's shown there that the last there of the verse is a broad assessment, which includes keeping our faith a secret. That's part of doing evil. And in such days, going off mission because we're afraid or intimidated, that's part of doing evil. That's what we would call a sin of omission, especially in light of what we are called to, to be about. Because if we keep our faith a secret and we just stop because we're worried about repercussions, you know, that's just contributing to the downward slide. You know, giving a reason for the hope that we have must come from the truth of Scripture. 
And in a very real sense, the scriptures, as they've, they've come down to us from God, are our lifeline. And one day we may be choosing between a conviction, you know, this is God's authoritative word, or our life. You know, how does, how does Satan typically work? If somebody comes up to us, you know, at gunpoint, let's just say now, you know, comes up to us at gunpoint right now and says, recant your statement that this is God's word. You say it's the truth, recant or die. Um, I'd like to think that most of us would say, do your worst. I'm not turning away from the word of God. But Satan knows throwing that abrupt test at us right now, he's actually, I think he's just going to get very few takers. Plus, he knows that God is going to give us strength when the time comes. So what does he do? You know, what does Satan do? Chip away. Chip away. He goes to work in little ways that separate us from the lamp and the light. He goes to work in little ways that separate us from the lifeline. Um, don't read it as much as perhaps where he starts. Don't, I mean, just basically ignore it. Which many believers make a habit of. In all of us, myself, all of us struggle with prioritizing the word of God in our life each day. But Satan's whole thing is, you know, uh, don't read it as much. That's how he begins to chip away. Entertain notions. Here's another thing that, that there might be something wrong with the way that things are worded. You know, introducing that, that little seed of doubt which is common in the culture today, that there might be something wrong with how specific things are expressed. Make a provision. Perhaps Satan does it this way too. He t pushes it further. Make a provision that there might be other valid ways of looking at salvation. You know, or example, there might be other ways of looking at those exclusivity teachings that are here. And all of that is made possible because people begin to entertain the notion that, though they may not admit it, they question whether there is absolute truth or actually whether this is absolute truth. And so, and so you have, you know, <clears throat> as that progresses poco a poquito, you know, a person will one day sell out the God that they said they once trusted. The, the test throughout history never ceases. The insinuation never stops. Did God really say? And as Cedar Creekers, will you stand with me? Will you stand with me and respond when the question comes, did God really say he certainly did? Will you stand with me? All right, then let's stand. Those who say we stand when God's or when Satan comes along and says, did God really say we stand and say, he certainly did. <laughs> he certainly did. And, and so what I'd, like, what I'd like us, you know, as you're standing with me for a moment here, in our documents as a church, being part of the Evangelical Free Church of America, we have the following in our, state, in our statement of faith. And I'd like us to read it together as we're standing here this morning this is point number two of our, of our uh, doctrinal statement. 
Read it with me. We believe that God has spoken in the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, through the words of human authors. As the verbally inspired word of God, the Bible is without error in the original writings. The complete revelation of his will for salvation and the ultimate authority by which every realm of human knowledge and endeavor should be judged. Therefore, it is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And perhaps we don't refresh often enough our doctrinal statement, but that's point number two. It is a reasonable conviction that the Bible is the very word of God. It's not unreasonable. And it's not a leap of faith. It's not what existentialism is, a leap into the unknown, unverifiable unknown. It is a reasonable conviction that the Bible is the very word of God. In other words, it's not unreasonable or silly. And so then we come to the punchline this morning we'll address in the form of a question, where did the Bible come from? Who actually authored it? You know, it, I was talking with one of our, our, our folks and um, I appreciated that conversation because there were, there were parts of that conversation where the person was reflecting on one of the objections that their family, part of their family has who have not followed Christ and who have not become a believer because they have an issue with the whole source of where the Bible came from. Where did the Bible come from? Who actually authored it? Some say, and this is what the person's family member says, some say the Bible was handed down by men, not by God, therefore it's not authoritative to me. That's common. That objection, we hear it, or it's insinuated. This is one of the, the common objections, and it comes phrased in many different ways that boil down to, you know, to how we've worded it here, shall we say. Some say the Bible was handed down by men, not by God. And then the implication is because there is a feeling off the hook in terms of submitting to its disclosure about who God is and what his standards are, then the, the last part of it, it's not authoritative to me. And so lots of people we cross paths with are wrestling with this form of source, we'll call it source skepticism. We surmise it's unfair but the belief is propagated widely and, it's, and, and often it's just parroted from one person to another. Um, remember, some are not ready to accept scripture as divinely inspired due to the implications for life change. Um, most people realize would be asked of them if it were from God, divinely inspired. We need to, to neither be on the defensive nor on the attack, but proceed respectfully as if we're sharing with a friend in attempting to answer this. Try summarizing it this way. If somebody comes along and says, the Bible was handed down by men, not by God, therefore it's not authoritative to me. You know, try, try summarizing it in this way. You know what? It really comes down to the question of where did the Bible come from? If it is just handed down by men, then I'm with you. Um, I'm not staking my life on it either. But if it's from God, there's reason to actually hear what it says. Even if, you know, even if people are playing the odds, it would be smart to know what their rejection, what, what they are rejecting. And the point is, check it out for yourself. 
you know, it's just too big of a, of a, of a point in life to just let some prof or someone else tell you how you should think on this without personal research. And so what would be wrong with saying, you know what? If there's nothing to the scripture, I'm with you. But if it's from God, that's a whole different story. Unless, of course, we just don't want to know what it says. And there are lots of reasons for that. So, you know, when you come, you know, when you, uh, come to think of it, part of, part of the thing that we should encourage and be humble about in talking with people is like, you know, none of us has exclusive knowledge and we shouldn't act like we have exclusive knowledge or just take the word of someone else on something so key to life as this. In what other ways do people tend to abdicate? Well, I just to say, I was about to finish that. In what other ways do people abdicate thinking for yourself? <laughs> but we know that that's happening every single day. That, for example, the network news gets turned on. Well, consider the Bible's claims about itself. This is a way with, if you have with some time with some people, friends or whoever, family members, if you have some time, um, take the time, make the time. You know, what's more important than that? Consider the Bible's claims about itself. There's a lot of what is called internal evidence that claims that, that this book is of divine origin. Tons of internal evidence. Now, as you know, we're doing the three weeks, so you got to have this all together, take it together. So, but we're starting there, as is proper. You know, there's a lot of what we call internal evidence that claims that this book is of divine origin. First of all, this book, God's Word, claims divine inspiration. It claims that it came from God. It begins with that. In fact, let's look at two verses. We're just going to quick read them. We're not going to go into the details of them. But 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All scripture is breathed, all scripture is breathed out by God. And then second, Peter. And we remember this just from a few months back from our time in Second Peter and getting into specifics there, but just let's read part of this verse 20, knowing this first of all that no prophecy of scripture comes from one's from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These verses are among many that discuss divine inspiration. And the Eng English word inspiration, I guess we should say that term in English with its prefix there, in, inspiration. We might, it, you know, it might give the impression that, and this is not a term that is in the Bible that way, inspired. It's God breathed, which is more specific than our English word. Way more specific than our English word. So, so we put that in a translation, you know, in, inspired. Um, and it gives the idea, it gives the impression, that term, that, or it could, that you know, after the various books of the Bible were written, God breathed into them so that they were inspired. That's kind of what it gives the impression of. That after 
the various books of the Bible were written, God breathed into them so that they became inspired. I mean, that is not the way to look at it. That is just not. The Greek word means that God breathed out. He breathed out and the result was the scriptures. So metaphorically speaking, the Bible is the breath of God. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> the mouth of God, mouth of God was regarded as the source from which the divine message came. Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. So Psalm 33, verse 6 is an example of how the Hebrew equivalent, or example of the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek God breathed. The same mouth that spoke all creation into existence is the mouth that spoke producing the scriptures. You know, as Lutzer writes um, about this from the original languages, he says, inspiration does not just mean that God approved of their writings, but that men actually wrote his words. His ideas became their ideas and they accurately recorded what he wanted us to know. The Old Testament reveals in numerous places, I'm still quoting, that God is portrayed as communicating with people in actual spoken words, not simply through general ideas. So consider the definition of, you know, of what we're trying to say here. With such things at stake for the souls of God's beloved image bearers, it would not make sense if he were to allow saving truth to get convoluted somewhere in the process. You know, like, like try to move on some Old Testament prophet's heart and then hope for the best that he writes it down correctly. God doesn't paint himself into that type of corner. He makes sure. And we're going to find out in this week and next week and the following why we can trust it. Why he did make sure. If he sent his son Jesus Christ to suffer and give his life with the message of exclusive belief in him in order to be saved from our sin and be with him for eternity, this makes sense that it would be something God, it would make sense that his word is something that God, if he's the author and overseeing the transmission of it would keep pure and he does and he did it through breathing the message with preciseness that the miraculous nature is that inspiration also allowed for the use of the style and the vocabulary of the mouthpieces God was using which is the miraculous nature of it it's a it is amazing and what is found on this matter of um, salvation, for example, what is found in, you know, all of that it teaches, but let's just look at the core thing that has to do with our souls be either saved or damned is you cannot find any contradiction in the message of the gospel. There are things that people interpret wrongly with proper study, you know, those contradictions are not seen to be the contradictions they once were believed they were. We're going to get into some of that. But writers, the, the writers were all on the same page, uncharacteristically as human beings, on the same page. Um, that never happens in any historical document where several writers are contributing to it. You know, and more on the, the, the accuracy piece next week. But first, mention quickly the claims of the Old Testament. We're talking about internal evidence. The claims of the Old Testament, there are hundreds of instances where God is described as speaking. Just two examples. We're just going to use two. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah uh, chapter 1, verse 2, the uh, first part of it. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. So you have that prophet Isaiah writing in this way, and then you have Jeremiah, another prophet, uh, the beginning of his uh, book, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were 
in Ananoth in the land of Benjamin to whom the word of the Lord came. In each of these instances, again, just two of the hundreds and hundreds is God is portrayed as communicating with people in actual spoken words, not simply through general ideas. The distinguishing characteristic of a true prophet is that he does not speak his own words, but the words of God. Prophets often spoke for God in the first person, claiming incredible authority. If, if you call the Old Testament, the authors of the Old Testament to the witness stand, if you were to call them all there, they would affirm with one voice, we are speaking the words that have been given to us from God. And therefore we can say, thus saith the Lord. And I'll tell you what, there were repercussions for a prophet that was wrong. Claims of the New Testament. New Testament writers have the same ring of authority. They, they cite the Old Testament as the word of God. They do that regularly. They put their own letters on that level as well. Peter made a direct link between the word he was preaching and the unchangeable words of the Old Testament. Paul, who authored at least 13 books in the New Testament, we're not sure about Hebrews, but he claimed to have received revelations from God and wrote what he was told to say. And John claimed that the visions that comprise the book of Revelation are the words of the Lord. Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the, prof of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. If those writers were thinking that what they were writing was just their opinion, who do they think they ought to say something like that? If you don't like my opinion, you think there's something wrong with it? You know, God's going to essentially strike you dead. They knew they were writing for God. As Lutzer observes, for Paul, for Peter, and John to have made such claims, you know, what they wrote would have been sheer madness, of course, unless, of course, they were, in fact, speaking the words of God. What if, you know, we were to, to, to systematically page through um, the Bible, listing all of the instances in which it claims to be of divine origin, either directly or indirectly, we would find some 1,500 statements that claim its divine origin. The 66, the 66 books speak with a consistent voice that they are words of God. And given that we've just said this, I'd like, to, I, I'd like to just take a moment to address a popular belief that the red letters of the Bible are somehow more God's word than the parts that are not in red. Have you heard that? It re Perhaps meaning well when those editions are printed for people, but it presents a troubling implication. The scripture, all scripture is inspired by God. It says that of itself equally. Not some more inspired than others, depending on who said it. You know, we're not implying that all the writers are themselves equal with Christ. Because the red letters are Christ's words. We're not implying that all the other writers of scripture are on equal, are on equal par with Christ. But that's not what we're saying here. Um, remember, what, but what we're saying is, 
what they said is equally God's word. That's what we're saying. Now, we might think, oh, that's kind of dissing Jesus, kind of a little, it feels like that. Our view of divine inspiration dictates the fact, and it's not just our view, it's the, if listening to what the scripture says about itself, is that we cannot say, well, I'm more inclined to, to obey what Jesus said than Paul. If, we, if, if there were anything to that, that just undermines the entire uh, teaching, authoritative teaching of the word of God. Now, recall for a moment what Paul said about receiving from the Lord and passing on to us. You know, we would have a faulty view of divine inspiration if we imply that what was then written by Paul was somehow secondary in value than what Jesus said that was also heard by writers and recorded. You know, I have a little trouble with the red letter editions and especially this prevailing thing that's going around now that says we've got to deconstruct the Bible to where all we have left is the red letters and then we're safe. They've bought into, whoever does that, buys into the fact that there's something wrong with the revelation of God. You know, when we open up the word of God, we need to see that it is all his divine word. And um, the unity of the Bible here, let's just quick say, I'm just going to read two paragraphs from Dr. Lutzer just because he does a great job describing what is a true miracle of divine inspiration. First, he contrasts. He contrasts what isn't divine inspiration. He contrasts it. Joseph, Joseph Smith, I'm quoting, Joseph Smith claims to have received a message from an angel, and thus the Book of Mormon came to be. But... His claims are suspect for at least two reasons. First, the Book of Mormon has been shown to be hopelessly untrustworthy at every point of its history in the statements it makes about history. Not a single geographical site recorded, and there are many in the Book of Mormon, has been discovered. Nor has any event in the book had independent confirmation Second, there are no other prophets who claimed to have a revelation that was consistent with his. The Book of Mormon has but one author, a man who plagiarized much of his material and whose personal character is suspect. And if you subject that same kind of evaluation, Muhammad the author of the Quran would fare no better. In contrast, now, the Bible is really a divine library of 66 books written about or written by about 40 different authors over a period that spans 1500 years. If one of the most important characteristics of truth is consistency, then we must ask, does the Bible present a unified storyline? God's message cannot contradict itself. And guess what? We find that it doesn't. The writers penned God's word at different periods of history. It's amazing. Under different circumstances, different countries, different cultures. And their writings do not contradict in any manner whatsoever. They dovetail with one another, not superficially, but intricately and brilliantly. It would be difficult enough to get 10 men to agree on so much as one single theological issue, much less 40 agreeing on matters about which others can only speculate. The, the Bible has unity of theme, unity of structure, unity of symbolism. 
the fact that the Bible has unity despite obvious differences in content, subject content, style, um, and perspective is what? What is this? It's a powerful witness to the independence of each author and it points to the real author. This is not just one guy coming up with sacred scriptures. God says, you know what? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not risking my word to that. I'm going to make this an unbelievable miracle that no one can deny. Um, yeah. So a seeker might not be ready to accept that it's authoritative. I get that. A seeker might not be ready if you're just hearing this for the first time. I'm just making the point. First of all, don't miss the next two Sundays, but I'm making the point that the internal evidence is super strong. And we haven't even delved into fulfilled prophecy, which is in itself miraculous. And uh, I'll just say this because we're going to cover some of that next week. But fulfilled prophecy provides overwhelming proof of the Bible's divine origin. And here's what we're going to cover, you know, um, you know, why would, you know, uh, let me just wrap up here, okay? What are we doing these few weeks here? We're doing what we need to be doing all along, is refreshing ourselves with a, with an, a deep understanding of, of what the Bible is. It's being attacked. And even in our own mind, if we were, if we were honest, we would say, yeah, there's been some thoughts that have entered my mind and I, I dismiss them. But, you know, the cultural conditioning is like getting really strong. And, you know, evidence proves to, I mean, over time, people who are culture who are bombarded with with uh, propaganda eventually begin to accept little parts of it the only way that we can stop going down that path is saying lord i need the mind of christ in this culture and i need to know what your word says because you know what? I'm seeing friends and people I know who are jumping ship on this word. How can I not, how can that not happen to me? And so this needs to be some of what we're thinking about. We're establishing, what are we doing these th three weeks? We're establishing some groundwork here before we take up that little mini series on holy sexuality. And with such a controversial subject matter, as in many this, these days, it's important to refresh our mind on how or how and why we can trust the Bible. So next week, the next question, which is a typical question too, how can we know it's accurate? Okay. The first one was, you know, it just came... You know, it just came down, for, it was just handed down from men, not God. So therefore, it's not authoritative to me. And the other one, which we're going to address next week, is how can I know it's accurate? Because that's a lightning rod for a lot of criticism by a lot of people who actually have never checked into it for themselves. Um, some say the Bible's full of contradictions. So how can it be trusted? Some say... It's been changed so many times, it's no longer recognizable or relevant. We're going to look at that next week. Next message, we'll dive into the question of, that, of the Bible's accuracy, which again is a point that many skeptics have never checked into, are only parodying something that someone else told them.
in many cases. So it's as if, as we conclude, God says, you know, I write that, but I'm like, I'm not claiming divine inspiration. (laughs) But God conveys. I authored it. These are what he, you know, and he says this. I authored it. And you have something substantive to say when Satan and others go on the attack. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, that we would refresh our mind by the, uh, a brief journey through your word. I know there's so many details and we, we, we don't want to make the messages super long. Um, but we want to focus and we ask your Holy Spirit that you would open our eyes and hearts. And we thank you for the assurance that we have that when we open up the word of God, we know that it's from you, our creator, who desires to have a relationship with us, who reveals in his word how to know you and what the barrier is and how Jesus came to deal with that barrier, the barrier of sin that each of us have. We thank you for the gospel, the good news that faith in Jesus Christ not only saves us from the the just deserts of our sin, but provides for us the righteousness of Jesus Christ and in eternity with you in your presence. Lord, we pray if there's anyone here who has not yet believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, which is the message of your word. Lord, today they would find themselves drawn over that line of faith, talking to someone today, perhaps another believer here who can open up the word of God and say, this is how we know Jesus. This is how we are born again into his family. And Lord, I I pray for that individual, whoever they may be, who might still be on the fence, trying to figure some stuff out. But we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be at work. You lift the blinders from our eyes. Has to be you. It's not our intellect. Has to be you. And so we thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.